Hello everyone, welcome to Simburn. Now, Bino plays Ace Attorney Trilogy episode 89. It's 9.30 in the morning because I had to wake up at 6.30 to go to a doctor's appointment. Oh my god, how do people live in this time period? I don't understand. Did you know that I never examined this drawer full of betting ticket stubs? Which is exactly the evidence that I was missing? Losing horse racing tickets? For the, uh... Makatama of this one chick. So, you know, pretty great. I don't know how I could have managed to miss that. That doesn't make any sense to me. That it, Was it not there the first time? I would have clicked on it. I would have clicked on it if it was there the first time. That drawer had to have been closed the first time we came here, and then it was open. Like somebody was rifling through it or something. I don't know. I don't know, man. There's no way I missed it. But if I missed it, then that's unfortunate, but let's do this. We'll just skip through the dialogue of, like, the first two questions and get right into where we messed up. Or where we had to quit before. Did Mr. Elg's troubles have something to do with the... That's right, it was the lottery ticket. Hmm, it is a lottery ticket. It's like, what is the, the gambling habit? What? I don't think that's logical. It wasn't restricted to the, lot lot the lottery, though. It was also... These losing horse racing tickets. The lottery? Horse racing? He bought a lot of tickets and lost a lot of times. That's got to have hurt his wallet pretty bad, don't you think? Maybe bad enough to be the cause of some pretty serious trouble, perhaps? Oh wow, she is leaking oil or something right now. No! You are right. Glenn did have a gambling habit. You good people must not follow his example, do you understand? Trust me, even if I wanted to, I don't exactly have the money to buy any. Are lawyers not paid anything in this? Like, I don't understand. It seems like prosecutors make bank, but defense attorneys are just like the common rabble. But, if you win, there's no problem, is there? And Glenn had a winning ticket, didn't he? For half a million dollars? Yeah, but... It's hard to imagine how he could have been in trouble then, isn't it? It's true that Mr. Elg won half a million dollars, in the end, but that was his first stroke of good luck. He was in deep trouble before that. Deep trouble? What do you mean? Mr. Elg's real problem was with someone or something more terrifying and ferocious. Um, would we do Glenn's calendar? Or would we... I, I feel like it's more direct if we just say the actual person. Furio Tigre. The boss of a loan office called Tender Lender. Tender Lender? People with businesses should think harder before naming their offices. Like you're one to talk. Well, what do you think? Our firm is doing very well at the moment. I don't think we need to borrow money. No, no, no. I mean about Mr. Elg. You think Glenn had something to do with this Furio Tigre? Yes. I'm sorry. I don't know of any connection between the two of them. Really? Because I've got proof that Mr. Elg and the Tiger knew each other. Ooh, would that be the calendar then? Probably. Furio Tigre, aka the Tiger, is the boss of a loan office called Tender Lender. This is who Mr. Elg met with on the day of his murder. And the only thing a loan shark would talk with him about would be his debt. No! It's true that Glenn had racked up quite a bit of debt from his gambling habit. About $100,000, I think. $100,000? Ouch. But I heard he won the lottery, so he should have been in the clear. Shane Maggie couldn't get a bit of that good luck. Okay. So the guy got lucky and won the lottery. But what if he hadn't won? What was his plan then? Well, uh, this isn't easy to say, but... He said he would use his talents to repay the money. His talents? I suspect he was talking about programming. What computer program is worth $100,000? Perhaps you good people should leave so I can get back to my work. I'm so close to cracking her. The program in question. Was it by any chance... This? MC Bomber. MC Bomber. Bum ba dum bum 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 bum. Well, this is it, isn't it? This is the virus that's infecting computers worldwide as we speak. 
MC Bomber. No! Glenn's head had more processing power than any computer, but it had been infected with a gambling virus. Glenn was in too deep. You mean he was in debt? Yes, $100,000 in debt, not an easy amount to repay. So, he said he was taking on some extra work, something a bit risky. Risky? How? Maybe he was going to become a waitress at Trey BM. Where do you come up with these ideas? So it's safe to say Mr. Elg was the creator of this virus, huh? The MC Bummer virus? Yes. It was a work of genius. In a bad sort of way, of course, but still genius. Something like that would probably fetch several million dollars on the black market. Inconceivable! Gumshoe was right for a change. This date, December 3rd, that is marked on his calendar, that was his deadline for repaying his debts. I guess we won't be needing these horse racing tickets anymore. Glen Elg's losing horse racing tickets thrown back on the floor. Oh, dude, I totally get it now. I totally get what happened. So he came in there and met with Tigre like, yo, here's how I'm gonna pay back my loan. But then he oversold it and he was like, dude, this MC Bomber CD virus thing, it's gonna be worth millions of dollars on the black market, you hear me? And then after he said all that, he went and won the lottery and then it's like, you know, Tigre needs a million dollars to pay for this uh, operation that still hasn't been paid. So Tigre was just seeing this dude have all this good luck, like, directly in front of him, all these prospects. And he was like, dude, you don't need $500,000 and a mil millions of dollars for the virus. So he... They said the winning ticket's never been found, right? Well, I mean, he doesn't really need the winning ticket anymore if he if he took the, vi the, the virus. And has evidently used it, uh, perhaps to, you know, show some buyer that, hey, look what this can do. You know, so, to prove its worth. But, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe he's trying to sell it, like, specifically to that dude. Bruto Cadaverini, like, hey, you want to buy this viral program? Pay me for this viral software thing, and I'll pay off your thing, you know? Okay, well, that's all you have. So now that we know that, yeah, we finally have to be seeing Jean Armstrong some more. Hey, bonjour! I have been waiting for you to return! Mr. Armstrong... Ah, uh, good timing. I was hoping to find you here. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, he hasn't got anything to say- Oh. Oh, that's not him talking. Well, he hasn't got anything to say to you, fellas. Ah, it's Zinneo. Who you calling Zinneo? Ah! Come out from under the table already, Maya. Okay, hand it over. What? You just want to play games with me? I don't recommend that. The medical papers, now! Uh-oh, I think he wants Viola Cadaverini's papers back. You mean this? The million dollar medical papers? Miss Cadaverini trusted you. That's why she said that she helped you. Forget about it! That girl's dumber than an eggplant! You just want to know what's sad? I'll tell you what's sad, and it ain't only her face. She thinks she's got power because she's Bruto's little girl. Now that's sad. I can't let you have these papers. Tomorrow in court, I'm going to expose what you did to get the one million you used to pay this off. Are you crazy or something? I don't care if you want to give it to me or not. There's two of us here. You got that? Two. Uh, oui. Oh, oui, oui. Mr. Armstrong? Forgive me, Desole. I cannot argue with him. Uh, uh, that really hurt. Is that all you's got? I'll be taking those papers now. Armstrong, get that lighter. Wait. 
Don't take it too hard, Phoenix Wright. That was so stupid. I shouldn't have let my guard down. Yeah, dude, this is like the third time in three games you've done that, so... Hello, dangerous person! Here's the evidence that I'm gonna use to put you away and possibly to death! Oh, what are you gonna do about it? Shlorpy dorp! I'm Adam Sandberg. Or Andy Sandberg, excuse me. Detective Gumshoe? D detective You think you're gonna stop me, Kappa? Beat it! Wah! Whoa. C come on, Gumshoe. Keep it together. You guys, get out of here. Leave this guy to me. B but... Go, pal. And take this. If you get hurt, who's gonna look after Maggie, huh? Huh. <sighs> All right. Thanks, Gumshoe. Wait, Nick. Don't leave me behind. I'll get even with that guy tomorrow. In court. Yeah, okay, phone. Okay, house phone. Dude, it's so stupid that it has to be hooked up in this room. Because it... My last house phone didn't have to be, like, connected, wired to, like, the whole internet hookup thing. Because, like, this is where my router is, and it has to, like, go through the wall or something. It's a bunch of garbage. But that's how it is, man. Comcast, a piece of shit. Yo, we gotta break up the internet providers. Break up the monopolies! Get that state-sponsored internet going, dude. Hell yeah, Patriot Act! Let's do this! Alright. Good morning, Mr. Wright. Good morning, Maggie. So, what do you think is going to happen today, sir? Yesterday's session didn't go so well and ended on a giant mystery. That's true. And we still haven't solved a single part of it yet. Are you okay, Nick? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. I saw that! That little flash of doubt in your eyes! No, uh, that wasn't doubt. That was, um, determination. Why don't I believe you? It's nearly time, Maggie. You better get going to the defendant's seat. Roger, don't let me down, Mr. Wright. I'm counting on you. Hey, pal. Hey, Detective Gumshoe. Quit stressing Maggie out. She doesn't need that. Uh, how did you know she was stressed? I was watching through the doorway. Oh, you look like you lost the case already. Show a bit of confidence, will you, pal? Here, maybe this'll help. Huh? Have you taken up aromatherapy too? Finally, we see that again. Not in a million years, pal. Don't tell me that you don't remember this thing. Hmm, come to think of it, that doesn't look like one of those aromatherapy bottles. This is the small bottle that turned up in Trabian's kitchen a couple days ago. Wow, look at all these little bottles. See, this is a warranted flashback because it has been like a long time since they mentioned that. Oh, they're aromatherapy, oil aromatherapy oils. Oh man, what are you like? Hey, what's your job? Oh, I'm an aromatherapist. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. There's one bottle that's different from all the others. <laughs> What's my specialty? Aromatherapy? <laughs> it doesn't smell... Yeah, yeah, okay. But, like, everybody remembers. We finally got the analysis results back from the lab. So, what is it? Is it the poison? I'm afraid not, pal. It's... medication. Is it his... it's his ear shit? Medication? Yeah, for ears. Topical use only, apparently. For ears? You mean... Yeah, it's the medication Glenn Elk was using for his ruptured eardrum. So the cook... Ju the chef just stole it because kleptomania? What was Glenn Elk's ear medicine doing in the kitchen? Um, what about the unidentified fingerprints? Anything on that? Someone screwed up, so they only had time to analyze the contents of the bottle. Another hour and they might have gotten something on the prints, but... Hmm, that's going to weaken its impact as a piece of evidence. Okay, pal, this is it. Make sure your defense is impregnable today, got it? Today's trial. I'm gonna expose that guy for what he's done, or my name isn't Phoenix Wright.
Court is now in session for the trial of Maggie Bird. The defense is ready, Your Honor. Ready and waiting as always, Your Honor. Very good. Then we'll get underway at once. Yesterday we heard the testimony of Mr. Victor Kudo. He claims to have witnessed the defendant putting a powder into the victim's coffee. However, the witness's testimony was plagued with a number of problems. The mark on the rim of the cup shows that the victim drank from it with his right hand. But according to the old man's testimony, he picked it up with his left hand. Thank you, Mr. Godot. Furthermore, according to the witness's account, the victim was listening to the radio with an earpiece in his left ear. Yet the victim's left eardrum was ruptured, which made him effectively deaf in that ear. It's amazing how many contradictions a single case can have, huh, Nick? Ha! Allow me to enlighten you, Your Honor. The world, you see, keeps turning, and we must turn with it. You've lost me already, Mr. Godot. Don't let the mysteries of yesterday mystify you today. Only losers think like that. You've got to change with the times. That's one of my rules. Are you implying that you've resolved these contradictions? You, you know the answers to these riddles? The old guy wasn't just throwing seed in here. He was throwing us off the scent. And today, I'll prove it. Very well. Let the first witness take the stand. Please don't be him again. Okay. I mean, I don't like this either, but you know. And you are... Oh, bonjour, everyone! I am John Armstrong, the owner and lead chef of La Trebian Restaurant. Enchanté! Forgive me for asking, witness, but are you a woman? Oh la la, monsieur! As you can see, I am le pert and perky gentleman, no? Oh, so he doesn't think he's a woman? Okay. I thought he did. Uh, um... On the day of the incident, you were in Trebien's kitchen. Isn't that right? Who is you, monsieur? Everything feels right. Ha. <laughs> wow, he's totally unfazed. Doesn't anything intimidate this guy? Very well, your testimony, please, witness. Please tell the court what happened that day at Trey Bien. We oui, volunteers! When it all happened, there were just two customers in my restaurant. I remember I was experimenting with some new art deco that day. Like having a large mirror between the tables, for example. Oui, perhaps that is what the old man was looking at. La coupe, la earpiece, and the glasses. It would have seen everything in reverse, no? Um, m mirror? Oui, un grand mirror, la most enormous mirror. And suddenly the mystery disappears. Like I said, the world keeps turning, so roll with it. Hmm, that would explain the coffee cup and the earpiece conundrum. The mirror would have made everything appear back to front. What the heck? It's way too early in the morning for this to be happening to me. Now then, Mr. Wright, you may begin your cross-examination. Oh, I'm going to be very cross with my examination. <laughs> when it all happens, there were just two customers in my restaurant. I mean, Victor Kudo and Glen Elg. I mean, we know that's a lie, but we don't know. Well, I mean, we can't prove it's a lie, specifically. But let's press this. And who were the two customers, exactly? Mice, of course. La young man who died. And la other not-so-young man. Hmm, you are referring to yesterday's witness, I presume. What about the other man Maggie says she saw at the table? Something tells me Mr. Armstrong isn't planning to disclose his existence. We need some hard evidence first before we can bring him up, don't we? I guess I'll just have to try a different approach for the time being. And with some new art decos that day. 
You were experimenting with Art Deco? How come I never heard about that before today? You are not familiar with the language of interior design, monsieur? Please stay on topic. Now why didn't you tell the court about this before? But I did! Just a few moments ago! <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Armstrong. This deco you mentioned, are you referring to some sort of decoxture? No, no, art deco. It is a style of design, your honor. He's talking about interior design. Walls, ceilings, carpets, that kind of thing. Ah, yes, of course. That deco. I was trying to achieve a more effeminate look for my restaurant. I was planning the most bold remodeling of la decor. Like having a large mirror between the tables, for example. How big of a mirror are we talking about here? Buff! I don't know what that word is. Something about four meters wide and, uh, oui, about two meters high. Let's see, if one meter is about one yard. Holy glass in a frame, that's huge. Holy glass in a frame, Batman! I was intending to install it on the ceiling eventually. The ceiling? Mirror on the ceiling! Ayo, ayo. Was there a mirror on the ceiling? I don't remember. Nice, no. But I decided not to go through with it in the end. What should I do? Should I ask him more about the mirror or not? Or not? Like, is any of this for real? Or not? If you really had such a large mirror in the restaurant, someone would have noticed it. I'm just full of references today. But there's nothing about a mirror in Mr. Kudo or Maggie Bird's testimonies. But, but You didn't ask, Trite. You have only yourself to blame for such sloppy work. What? A mirror was delivered to Trebien the day before the incident. Really? As Mr. Armstrong testified, he was carrying out some design changes. And as it turned out, he didn't actually use the mirror in the end. This just doesn't add up. Even if a mirror was delivered to Trebien, it doesn't prove that it was in the restaurant on the day of the crime. Ha! If you want to doubt someone, Trite, look in the mirror. I'm sure the person looking back at you will be dubious enough. Hmm. So the witness yesterday had seen the victim reflected in a mirror. Oui, perhaps that is what the old man was looking at. Didn't we see a mirror in the kitchen? But, like, we wouldn't have that in our, uh, evidence pool. <clears throat> Normally, I... I don't know why I cracked my voice there. Nor... <coughs> oh, what's happening? <coughs> Am I dying? <coughs> Is this the end? <coughs> Mama! <coughs> Papa! Normally, I'd expect people to know the difference between a reflection and a real object. Normally? How does normality come into this? That's lame, Trite, even for you. Huh? Are you trying to say that if something isn't normal, it isn't possible? Is that it? Where, where does that leave the pork headed lawyer and the top-knot chick over there? And the ungodly cool guy with the mask over here? Well, trite? Ah! Not the hair! I do not have a top-knot! Mr. Godot is correct. A lack of normality is no basis for discounting an argument. Bien! Logic as one a day! La cup, la earpiece, and the glasses. It would have seen everything in reverse, no? Not the glasses. The cup, yes. The earpiece and glasses, no. Wait. Hold on. But if that's yeah, that's no, okay. What this is the issue? I'm trying. Okay, hold on a sec. Where is Glenelg? There you are. Or an HMD over the left eye, and the left eardrum was ruptured. But then, and then they said that he with his left. So with all three of them were on the same side. So, left ear, left eyepiece, and left cup? Or was one of those things not like the other? It was right. 
the mm, would the coffee cup get rid of this? No, it would not. Okay. Then which one of them will? One of these is not like the others. Like I guarantee you. Aha! I knew it was one of them. The coffee cup, the earpiece, and the HMD. Let's think back over Mr. Kudo's testimony for a second, shall we? The boy was wearing the earpiece on the same side as the green lens of his specs. No question. You can lock me up if I'm wrong. It was his left ear without a doubt. So to summarize, we were told both the HMD and the earpiece were on the victim's left side. Now, if Mr. Kudo saw all that as a reflection in a mirror, it means both the HMD and the earpiece were actually on the victim's right side. Exact demand. You see, Monsieur, now that you think about it, it is not so hard, no? Unfortunately, that's where we run into a monumental contradiction with the facts. If Mr. Kudo really did see everything in a mirror, why is it that the HMD is now on the wrong side of his head? Order. Order! Mr. Wright is correct. If the witness genuinely observed the victim reflected in a mirror, then we would expect the victim's eyepiece to have been over his right eye. How bitter. Trite, you should have a taste of this bitterness. It'll calm you down in no time. Are we talking about your coffee or something completely different? What, like sucking his dick? Like, why'd you move there, right? You don't understand the way the witness thinks. How he thinks. You remember this, I presume. The I broke the vase sorry apology let I mean Mr. Kudo's sworn testimony? Exactly. The old man has one very grievous habit, other than throwing seeds. The more of an impression something makes, the more muddled his mind makes it. And what's the most striking thing about Mr. Elk? Clearly, it's the victim's eyepiece. And that's my point. The old man strikes again. Mr. Elg's HMD made a big impression on the old man. I saw the earpiece and those newfangled spectacles he was wearing. Oh yes, they were both on his left ear. Do you hear? His left ear. Ha. Huh. Well, Trite? Er... That's the worst, but best impression of Kudo ever. Oh, should I have actually, like, tried to do one? Damn, did I ruin a moment? Wow, I really thought he was old CD for a minute there. Godot's good. Oh, now we... Uh, I ruined it. Enough. I must agree that yesterday's witness was irresponsibly rash in much of his testimony. Bad luck, Nick. Looks like the boil of a contradiction you found is just a rash. A mirror can't be beaten by a handful of seeds, nor can it lie. So, what exactly was the old man looking at? Fill us in, Mr. Armstrong. Go on, tell the court. We're all ears. Oui, I can explain. Please, if you will look at the plans of the restaurant. Hello, is everyone sitting comfortably? La mirror, it was in the middle of the restaurant, dividing the two halves. There is only one seat from which you could have seen an image of la victim. That was the seat at the table next to la victims, where the old man was sitting. Nope, the old man was sitting next to the entrance, but thanks. After that terrible incident occurred, I moved la mirror so it was not in the way. But naturally, I did not touch anything else. Hmm, I see no problems with the explanation we have just heard. From the table next to the victims, Mr. Kudo could have seen the victim in the mirror. What a naughty little concrete I am, confusing all the men like this. Don't worry about it. We can keep up, except for the guy breaking out in a cold sweat over there again. Ugh! I hate that guy. 
You said you didn't touch anything else apart from the mirror. Are you quite sure about that? Volunteers! Of course! Very well. Mr. Wright, your cross-examination, if you please. Hmm. La mirror, it was in the middle of the restaurant, dividing the two halves. So, run this by me again. The mirror was here, correct? Oui. Oui? Really? Because I know if I were you, I wouldn't have put a mirror there. It would be in the way. Look who's talking, Trite. Huh? You're obstructing my view, among other things. B but this is my seat in the courtroom. Trebien's charm is that it gives you the impression that you're the only customer. Temporarily placing a mirror in that spot would hardly be in the way. Unlike you, Trite. I tell you, Monsieur, the mirror was there, in the middle of the restaurant! There is only one seat from which you could have seen an image of the victim. And where would that be? Oh la la, look how you lean towards me! I always attract the younger boys. Maybe I should keep you in suspense a little longer. Mr. Armstrong, tell the court what you know at once. I attract the older ones too, you know. Handsome. Shall I tease you too? Mm. I'm already seeing a very hot someone, so I'm afraid you'll be waiting for a long time. Ooh, I want to know who that is. I bet she has mocha cream skin and cappuccino perfume. Ben, I will tell you, there was only one seat from which you could have seen. That was the seat that's the table next to the victims. That was the little. Okay, so that's false. Because we know he was sitting at the entrance. But. The only way to prove that. Would be with the floor plans, but that doesn't disprove the fact that there was a mirror there. Okay, and that was a photo. But there was no mirror when this photo was taken. So, I think we can use this photo. Who took this photo? I mean, it still works, so. This piece of evidence contradicts with the testimony we have heard, Your Honor. The crime photo? Yes, this photo clearly shows something that theoretically should not exist. What on earth do you mean by that, Mr. Wright? Should not exist. Huh. <laughs> Sounds like you're describing yourself, Trite. Now then, if the defense would please clarify its statement. Oh boy. What is the something that should not exist in this photo? If the old man was sitting here, he knocked over his vase and this vase shouldn't exist. BAM! I think it's pretty obvious that this is what should not be in the picture. The vase? What possible connection does that have with this witness's testimony? Your Honor, I'm telling you that there should have been no vase on this table. Because it very clearly contradicts with this piece of evidence. I am a genius. There is one thing that was clearly demonstrated by yesterday's testimony. Mr. Kudo broke the vase that was on the table where he was sitting. And yet, as the court can see, there is an unbroken vase on the table next to the victim. Why? Because Mr. Kudo was not, in fact, sitting at the table next to the victim at all. Don't be an idiot, Trite. That's impossible. That seat's the only one Kudo could have seen the victim's reflection from. Exactly. Ugh. There is only one conclusion we can draw from this contradiction. There was no mirror in Trebian that day. Your testimony, Mr. Armstrong, is an elaborate lie. Mon dieu! <laughs> Don't try to confuse the court, right? Obviously, the witness cleaned up the vase while the police were taking their time getting to the crime scene. Unfortunately, Mr. Godot, that doesn't quite work for me. 
Mr. Armstrong already testified to the contrary in his own words. I did not touch anything else except the mirror. Uh, uh. Gag! Well, witness, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> I was right. There was no mirror in the restaurant that day. In light of this revelation, we return back to the original problem. Why did the victim have an earpiece in an ear in which he couldn't hear? Ha! You only get one shot in life. There's no turning back. If you want to claim that the mirror wasn't there, Trite. Oh, we might need to save here. Then this problem is all yours. How do you explain what the old man saw? If I can answer this, then I'll be that much closer to the truth. I can feel it. Are you going to be okay? Can you really solve this contradiction, Nick? There's more than just this one contradiction, Maya. What do you mean? Remember what Maggie told us? There was another man at the victim's table. And there was a sample CD on the victim's table. It all flies in the face of Mr. Kudo's testimony. And I think I know the reason why nothing in this case is adding up. Well, Mr. Wright, let's hear your answer. Yes, Your Honor. The reason behind all the contradictions in Mr. Kudo's testimony is simple. Mr. Kudo made a mistake? The ear doctor made a mistake? Yeah, right. The victim was a phony. Hmm. Mr. Kudo made a mistake. Clearly, Mr. Kudo made a mistake. Mr. Trite, you're the one who brought up all these contradictions. And? If you're trying to tell us the old man just made a mistake, we can wrap up this case right now with a guilty verdict. How about it, Mr. Wright? Should I just declare your client guilty? Is that the best you can come up with, Nick? Dude, what? Uh... I'm pretty sure this is wrong. I just want to see what happens. I believe we're looking at this the wrong way. It was actually the doctor's mistake. What? Yes, the doctor got the wrong ear. Well, I believe we saw an autopsy report yesterday, one that stated the victim's left eardrum was ruptured and had medicine in it. I'm beginning to wonder if it's not your eardrum that's ruptured, Mr. Wright. This is no time to be playing with people's perceptions, Nick. Do, 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 do. This case is riddled with contradictions. Yet there is one very simple answer that clears them all up. And what is that? The incident Mr. Kudo witnessed and the incident the victim experienced were two completely different events. What? Yes, the victim that Mr. Kudo saw wasn't Mr. Glen Elg at all. It was an imposter, a phony pretending to be Mr. Elg. Obviously, unlike the victim, there was nothing wrong with the imposter's left eardrum. That's how he ended up wearing the earpiece in his left ear by mistake. Huh? Pfft. Order! Order in the court! Settle down or I'll clear the courtroom! Quiet, Gramps. Why don't you clear out of here, huh? What did you say? Trite. Are you saying that what Mr. Kudo saw was a setup? Yes. Someone pretended to be Glen Elg and acted out the whole coffee poisoning. All for the express purpose of creating a witness out of one Mr. Victor Kudo. Ooh, so is Glen Elg still alive then? <laughs> um, but like, where's his body and shit? They, we ran an autopsy and everything. Get real, Trite. Why would anyone want to do that? Isn't it obvious? 
The thing Mr. Kudo was most insistent about in his testimony was... The serving girl brought him a Java Kino, but she put something in it. That's the serving girl right there in the defendant's chair. I remember her well. It's so hard to believe, but... There was one, and only one, reason to show Mr. Kudo this fake poisoning. To show Maggie Bird in the act of poisoning the coffee. Are you insinuating that the waitress in the old man's story was a fake as well? It's true that there were no other customers in the restaurant at the time, but... It's also true that the chef was there. He would have noticed what was happening. That's right. Well, witness, if your restaurant really was the scene of such theatrics, you would have known about it, correct? Oh la la, this is most difficult for me. No, it's quite simple. All you have to do is testify. You are under oath, after all. Was there, in fact, a phony at Trey BM that day? The defense demands that Mr. Armstrong tell the whole truth about what happened. The defense's request for additional testimony is accepted. And that's gonna do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you can like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.